Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Torch Snuffers Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Connors. With me, as always, is my wonderful co-host and Latina flavor, Alicia Garza. Hey, y'all. Also joining us today is the always insightful Jack. Hi there. And the girl of the bad Canadian internet, Elise Anderson. Hello. But that's not it. We also have with us the wonderful Matt Bischoff from Survivor, Fans vs. Favorites. Woo! What's going on, guys? Exactly. How you doing? Okay, so Matt, I am super excited for you to be here. We have a lot to talk about. It was a tremendous episode. Two castaways left, one left under, you know, extremely interesting circumstances. And in fact, that's how the episode began. So Matt, right off the bat, let's talk about what happened with Terry. And I guess the first question I want to throw at you, throw at you is something that I've always kind of wondered about. When you're a Survivor player... Do you tell production like, "Hey, if this happens, contact me," or, or what's the line about like what would happen if a family member like do you pick as a contestant, or does production tell you? How does that even work? Yeah, I mean, it's like one of those things going into the game. They, they, for example, had my wife's contact information. So if there was an emergency of any kind, you know, they would be able to contact my wife. Like if something happened to me on the island, I'm assuming they would tell her if something tragic happened but going out there there was never any kind of discussion on uh if something like what happened to terry would happen Mm -hmm. and for me like watching the episode and like well first of all jeff probes never comes out to your beach unless something major is happening the only time he came out to our beach is when on my season is when we had some issues with shamar and he was medically evacuated so if Jeff comes out, you know it's pretty serious. And, um, you know, for Terry, who's been wanting to play this game for a second time for so many years, and to have that happen with his son, I can't even imagine being in that position. Because for me personally, I'm a huge fan of Survivor. But my family is number one. So mm-hmm. I imagine he's like, obviously, oh my God, I got to get home to my kid. And he's probably 30, you know, I was in the Philippines. It was like 36 hours of travel to get to where I was. Mm -hmm. So to know that you'd have to go through all that travel and to walk away from the game you love so much, it sucks. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, family is most important. And I'm I'm real happy that Terry's kid's doing okay. Exactly. And do you think that, you know, maybe because some survivors maybe would not want to be pulled out of the game or something like that? Do you think there should be a line in the sand that contestants draw or that productions draw? Because I'm thinking back to Survivor All-Stars when Jenna Maraska quit because her, uh, I believe her father was extremely sick. Some of the contestants, I think Big Tom said, if one of my family members gets sick, I still want to stay out here. Or do you think production should always tell them? Well, I think it's, I think there's a difference. I mean, Terry's son obviously had a major issue with his heart and, and I, you know, needed a heart transplant, I guess mm-hmm. it was. So, uh, for me, it would have to be something major. If 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 my son broke his arm or something like that, I, I wouldn't want to leave the game for that. Mm-hmm. But if it was a life threatening family member dies, I, I think it was pretty serious for them to have pulled mm-hmm. Terry from the game. To be honest with you. Oh yeah, and I think I mean, does anyone here disagree with that? I, I highly doubt any yeah. of us uh-huh. do. Um, I guess. Um, I can go ahead and address this right off the bat. Matt, I listened to your Survivor Oz interview not too long ago, and you talked about how much you hate spoilers. Well, going into the season, I don't know how much you follow, but there was two major spoilers. And the first one was that Vetus used social media in day three of the game. So we all knew he got voted out very early. But the other spoiler was that Terry Dietz left the game due to his son being uh, sick and needing their heart transplant. And I think it kind of shows the spectrum of what kind of is acceptable I, as a fan? Because I threw a giant temper tantrum over the Vetus thing, but then I thought Terry's thing was completely understandable and acceptable. So I guess uh, what I want to ask you is, did you discover any of these type of spoilers? And what is your reaction to, you know, knowing that, hey, Terry came back and everyone just blew it out of the water? Well, here's the deal. I, I can't, I'm a, like I said, I'm, I'm like you guys. I'm a fan of Survivor. And to me, the coolest part of watching Survivor or a show like The Amazing Race, for example, is not knowing what's going to happen. To me, that's what makes Survivor exciting. Mm -hmm. So I I try to, as much as a fan as I am, and obviously, you know, so many of my friends have played Survivor Mm -hmm. at this point. Once you're part of the Survivor family, everyone, you know, talks and communicates with Mm -hmm. another. But I pretty much try to stay offline uh, around the times of, (laughs) like today, I didn't even go online at all. I don't want to see something pop up 
that I don't want to see. <laughs> now, I, I pretty much knew what was going to happen with the Terry thing, but with the Vetus thing, I didn't know, and I prefer not knowing, to be honest. Yeah. Some some people like spoilers, mm. but I, I you know I want to just see how it plays out. You know what I mean? Exactly, and I guess my big rant about the Vetus thing was that as a survivor, you know, alumni and player, he should be way more responsible than to actively use Instagram when the game's going on. I thought that was pretty, you know, almost selfish of him to be like, hey, it's clearly obvious I got voted out. Here's me on social media during day four of Survivor Cambodia. Well, here's the thing. I, I think there's people that are true fans of the show, that, that players that really respect the game of Survivor. Mm -hmm. Some, someone like Vetus, I don't know. What, was Vetus, besides the fact that his brother played Survivor, was was Vetus? Does he respect the game like mm -hmm. like others? I don't know. I don't know Vetus. I haven't hung out with him, but I think certain people that really um, respect the game would not want to do something like that. Yeah. I think it's almost like a, I don't know, just disrespecting. The, the sacred factor of the game kind of thing, you know? Exactly. And as much as, you know, Vetus is being spoiled was extremely awful, we all understood Terry's being spoiled. And to be frank, no one online even got mad at Terry. They were like, oh, this is silly. Okay. Um, I do want to jump to Jack because, interestingly enough, during Terry's leaving the game, Cass was the narrator. Evil villain Chaos Cass was the one getting confessions about how hard it was. And we saw with tonight's episode, Cass is dipping back into chaos, chaos, chaos Cass, I'm sorry. But what is, is going on with her edit? What is she doing? What's happening? I'm so confused. Why is Cass being sympathetic and then yet being Chaos Cass? I don't understand it, Jack. Well, I think up until this point, we've only seen the nice version of Cass because she talked about how she wanted to connect with people socially and just like, have emotions surrounding people and learn about their lives. And I don't know if I miss this. Does she have children? Yes. All right. I think that probably also hit home with her. That made it like step outside the survivor realm and like really hit home with these people that had children. Just I mean, like your kid having a life threatening condition or an injury, mm -hmm. and you're 36 hours, for example, away. Like that probably would really shake people. So I mm -hmm. think that's why she was like the main like emotional narration in that situation okay so you think she was the main voice because she was the one that could relate to it the most and not because you know the editors are trying to hide something good i think it's more so that she can relate and we've seen nice cast up until this point is why they threw her in there okay and at least you wanted to jump in on that oh no elisa's bad canadian internet i can't hear her. can you guys hear her no no oh no Wait, talk again. <laughs> We're going to give you one more try. If not, we are going to have to move on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. There we <laughs> okay. go. Okay. So um, I wanted to say I think they, the reason they used Cass is because out of all the other people who could relate, like Sierra, we would expect to get emotional. Savage, we'd expect to get emotional. Uh, but uh, Cass is known for being such an unemotional player that when she is breaking down and really relating to Terry in a genuine way, it's so much more powerful as a, as a viewer see Cass breaking down over anyone else over this. That's a very, very fair assessment. And maybe it goes beyond the whole Cass's, you know, arc of, is she nice? Is she good? Now, the next thing that happened in this episode, Matt, is something you know all too well about, which was a wonderful tribe swap. Now, Please, can you enlighten us? What is that feeling like when Jeff says, drop your buffs? Are you feeling dreadful? What's going through your head? You know, in, in my season, the tribe swap was ultimately my demise. It sucked. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, I've told this story before. Uh, the very first second that it happened, I was psyched that I was on a tribe with Michael and Julia, two people in my alliance. I mean, Michael and I were super, super tight. But then when I looked at the other tribe and I was like, oh, dude, all, all of, of the young athletic people, you had Malcolm and Eric and, and all these, you know, Eddie and, and everybody. I was like, we're going to get crushed in challenges. So I knew right from the get go that I was on the weaker tribe. And that feeling's terrible. There, there's a lot of luck involved in Survivor. And in my season, unfortunately, I had a lot of bad luck. You know, go to lost every challenge I ever did except the, you know, the one challenge when Francesca got voted out. And then, I, and then I got on a crappy tribe. So it's, it's the luck of the draw. I mean, this season there's been two tribe swaps. And, uh, 
you know, it's going well for some people, but for others, probably not so well. Exactly. And I guess uh, I do want to just take this little side note and just say this. Where were you on the second chance ballot? Where were you? Where was any yeah. member of Godot on second chance ballot? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing, man. I mean, obviously, I would love to play Survivor again. And the thing about um, the editing of Survivor, there was a lot of stuff that went down in my season, a lot of strategic gameplay, but they chose to focus on Philip Shepard and the Brandon Hans drama exactly. and Sh Shamar's loud mouth. So a lot of the true good Survivor play wasn't even being showed. So, so and there, there was a lot of hilarious, funny stuff that happened. And, and I, I'm not going to sit here and complain about my edit, because overall, when I meet people on the streets, there's been nothing but people saying positive stuff about my game and my gameplay. Um, but I just sometimes I'm like, man, I don't know if I lasted long enough to make that impact for you know something like Second Chances. And quite frankly, I was telling my wife tonight, I don't. I mean, if if they called me and wanted me to play Second Chances, I would 100% do it. However, I don't think it would be very fun this season. I think there's so many the stakes the stakes are so high, and it would be so stressful in, in the situation that. Um, I don't know. Even on Monica's, um, you know, she got voted out last week, and you saw some of her interviews. It was like it, it's so intense and so stressful mm -hmm. this time around. She she didn't even have a good time. I think that's maybe how I would feel. I would rather play like a another fan's favorites, kind of like Eric did, or mm -hmm. a blood versus water type scenario. You know. But I think you want to come back with fans versus favorites because you know they always rig it heavily for the favorites. So you would be sitting there on the beach that had all the coconut and the <laughs> fish and stuff. Meanwhile, me as a fan would be like on the beach that just had rocks. And that was it. There was not even branches. There was just rocks. And then they go, oh, this is fair. Trust me. It'd be yeah. like Angkor every episode. They'd be like, oh, move camps, fans. It's <laughs> yeah, time exactly. to build again. Exactly. That's hilarious. So anyways, with that big tribe swap, new dynamics came up. Um. This is normally when I would develop into like, oh, who's on what tribe and all that jazz. But we're merging next episode. So it's kind of all out the window. And that's what I was going to actually ask Jack. I was going to ask this to everyone. Should I just take all the notes I have on these relationships and toss them out because of the merge? Or do you actually think there's any chance of this these groups sticking together? Is there any chance of, you know, the buy on five of, you know, Wentworth, Joe, Steven, Tasha, Jeremy, and Keith working together? Is there any chance of that happening, or is it all just out the window? Jack, what do you think? Well, when they first said drop your buffs, I was like, is he going to merge right now? But then when they delved into two different tribes, I was kind of shocked. I just think the fact that they've gone from two to three back to two, and people are getting swapped all over, that so many relationships are convoluted, like in the game and people knew each other out of the game, that as a player, even as a fan, it's hard to keep track of. I can't imagine being someone in this game and trying to remember, like, oh, who knows who, like, who's in with that, and who doesn't like each other. It's it's pretty messy, to be honest. All I'm going to say is, Jack, try being a podcast host because all I have is a <laughs> list of four different alliances with five or six different names names in them. And it's just a giant, it's a giant cluster mess. Um, I, will, I will say, I thought it was interesting how much, we're going to jump to uh, Savage, how he seems to be almost throwing away this game. And I don't know if that's his personality. Alicia, you love Savage. Is this just his personality or does he really think that he, cause he seems kind of entitled. I mean, he got on the beach and he flat out said, Hey, uh, Cass, I have Wu and Abby and you have Sierra. Let's make a five. And then throwing Sierra's name out there. What's going through Savage's head? Um, I honestly, with the whole, let's throw Sierra's name out there. I don't know what was going through his head, but if anything was going through his head, it wasn't the right thoughts that he should have been having. Um, you definitely in that situation gather up your five, your crew, and you say, hey, you know, obviously we'll need to give Spencer a decoy, like, who should we do? Like, what are y'all thinking? Should it be me? Should it be someone else? Because you want to make yourself seem like a team player. You never want to seem like, mm -hmm. I don't like you as much as I like the others. It's just stupid. And it seems like even though he's getting a good edit, it is, you know, showing the flaws in this game. Now, Matt, this is a question I want to ask you. Is there any way on, you know, Tribe Swap, you go up to someone, you go up to Crin and go, hey, no matter what, I have Michael Snow. Me and him are a pair. You can't beat us. Would you ever do that? 
No, I mean, this, in Survivor, I, I think Savage, even you see him in Tribal Council, he, he's, he's so intense right now. Like, he, he, he's not showing any kind of emotion on his face except intensity. And to me, that's going to turn some people off. He's playing the game very hard. And as you see in his mm-hmm. confessionals, you know, he is dying to, you know, make it far into this game. But some of his stuff is, you know, he's he's playing it like he's a little bit cocky and that he's running the show. I think Savage, you know, at this point needs to kind of sit back and chill out a little bit because if he doesn't, he's going to be a huge target going into the merge. Um, but do you think what you are talking about earlier, the whole psychological aspect of this is my second chance, I've got to seize this, is what's messing Savage up? Do you think that's causing him to overplay? I think it's I think it's a lot of factors. I mean, just, he's been wanting to play for so long, and this is his second chance. And you've seen like some interviews with him, like, my life is perfect, everything is awesome in my life, except the fact that I didn't do the way I wanted to do in my first season <laughs> of Survivor. So there's there's a, there's a lot of stakes, you know, involved in the second chances. So I I definitely think that. You know, his emotion, and, and I'm not out there the second time, but I know when I was out there, I was playing the game hard, and you're thinking about the game, and it's such a very hard balance, especially when, like, so many players are playing so very hard in this season, you know? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's good, though. That's what makes a good season. I like seeing gameplay, and um, it's, it's, it's finally good that I think that there's – two tribes again and that they're merging next week because mm-hmm. some of the airtime has been dominated by Abby and Savage and what, you know, Jeff Barner exactly. and just a very few people. So tonight, and, like actually seeing Sierra and different people talk was a, was a breath of fresh air. And I actually wanted to say this, Jack, I know you were with me. I don't remember if Alicia was with me. When we were podcasting about your season, what I would say about it is that your season was the beautiful baby in the ugly outfit. Because here we had all these great characters like you and Michael, and I think people like Julia, who we didn't even get to know and hope, just being completely ignored because Probst had the audacity to think that we just want, well, I say Probst, I mean the editors just think that we just wanted to see Philip and Brandon and all the other shenanigans. So I guess what I would ask you, Matt, is do you think this season is being better edited, so to say, than your other season? Because, I mean, we are seeing a lot more of Savage than, say, Sierra, but do you think they're doing a better job or... I don't know, what would you like to see differently? Well, I, I think with, you know, this season there's so many great players and characters that are, that are you know, on this game. And when there's three tribes, for example, it's, it's hard to be able to show each one of those tribes. So I think as we get into future episodes, we're going to see a good balance of, of people mm-hmm. and their confessionals and their gameplay. And, uh, you know, yeah, on my season, it's, you know, in one hand, it was an honor to be able to play a fan's favorite season since there's only been two ever, and I got to play one of them. But honestly, if I would have had my choice, I would way rather play yeah. an all-newbie season because the, the, the fan, first of all, everyone wasn't even fans on the fans tribe. Yes. Yeah. And second of all, um, it's completely geared for a you know a favorite to win pretty much. Mm-hmm. 100%. You know, it's like for I'll give you an example. It's like if you play if if I went out in there and played a second time, I know so much about playing my first time. We were dying of thirst. We would go to a challenge and we would have like one canteen of water that we were like passing around um, for ten of us, right? And, and the other tribe would have full canteens. And we're like, what the hell are we doing wrong? We're boiling water all day long. And, and it's like, it's such a long process to do that. Mm-hmm. We'll come to find out, you know, the other tribe wasn't even boiling their water. They were just saying, hell with it. We're drinking exactly. the water. So if I went out there again, I, I, we were so dehydrated and had so much less food mm-hmm. than the favorites tribe. It was a complete disadvantage. So going into it again, I would just drink whatever water I could find. You know what I mean? It's not <laughs> like actually, making, you know. Yeah, this is something I wanted to Go bring ahead. up because a Reddit cameraman from Survivor, or a Survivor from a uh, Survivor cameraman was on Reddit. I don't know if you know about the website Reddit, and he said that the water in the wells is actually put in by production, you know, and it's refilled by production. So you don't even need to boil it. 
And I've always wanted to ask a player if that was true, but it sounds like that that could be completely true. Well, here's the deal. I mean, our water was in a well, but the well is in the middle of a jungle. Did I ever see anyone like place water in there? No, but the, you know, as a first time player, like you're so paranoid about getting sick or getting, you know, I was real cautious everywhere I would walk because my feet were so jacked up and lacerated. I did not want to get evacuated from the game. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're paranoid your first time around and your second time around, I think it'll be, like I said, easier on one hand, but also in the second chances season, everyone knows everyone's gameplay. So everyone knows going into this game that Spencer Bledsoe is a strategic player and Steven Fishback mm-hmm. is a strategic player. And uh, that's why I think it would be so hard. There's nowhere to hide your gameplay when everyone has True. seen it before, you know? Unless you're like Monica, but as we just saw, or we saw last week, being a Monica doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, speaking of Steven Fishback, right. I want to talk with Jack. Um, so this was almost a very cathartic episode for Steven, and we saw him break down and cry over, you know, this idea that he needed to take out Joe and that this was his second chance. And very much like what Matt said, to me, you are not a true survivor player unless you're willing to be crying and be filled with emotion. I mean, think back to when Russell Hans lost on Redemption Island. People were giving him junk for crying. You can give Russell all the junk he wants, but I like to see players so emotionally involved that they cry. What do you take on that? And what do you what's your take on Steven? Yeah, so I think Steven is even like listening to Rob as a podcast, you can tell that he's still upset and embarrassed by the way um, Token Chains ended. And you can tell that he wanted to change that when he came into the season. And so even in challenges when he's like messing up and isn't believing in himself and Jeremy's trying to like hype him up, you can tell he's just like trying to redeem himself in every single aspect of Survivor. And so when he sees Joe, this golden boy, that keeps giving him PTSD of um, JT, <laughs> he's like, hey, we got to get him out. I can't let myself get screwed over by the same way over and over again. And he just... He like can't get his group to go with him. He just feels like he's just gonna screw up again, and he just—it's just depressing for him probably to feel like he's gonna make the same mistake again, even it, if he's trying. Exactly, not to. it seems horrifying. And I want to jump to Elise and then Alicia, but Elise, isn't Stephen correct though in his strategic thinking that nah, we need to get rid of Joe? Because to me, it seemed completely obvious that he needed to get rid of Joe because Joe seems to want to keep Kelly Wentworth for some reason. I think it's obvious to him that you need to get rid of Joe, but you can't push it too much because uh, we know Steven was on the outs of Bayon at the very beginning. He has to be very careful because people might not be thinking, even if everyone else's thinking is wrong. Uh, you have to kind of go with the flow or else it'll be put against Steven. But I think it's very good that they included the part where he is relating it to his experience in token chains because it all makes a lot more sense when you see it from the perspective especially this is the beauty of second chance is that you see why he wants joe so bad uh, out so badly that he's like like, crying over it is just because like of what happened in token chains and i think that's makes it makes sense why steven would want that other people like jeremy might like we saw jeremy's like he we need a bigger threat because otherwise it'll be me so i think it's a lot is just depending on what season they came from and what their experiences were and then uh, alicia go ahead jump on but also isn't that a fault of steven not being able to convince jeremy to vote out joe are you asking me that yes oh um yeah, but I mean, it's still early, and Steven is a very intelligent guy, and so I don't I don't have any doubts that he'll at least be strategizing ways of bringing up conversations or certain subtle points that he can try and make because his brain is always working. And um, that leads into what I was going to say. His brain is always working. He's very strategic. Everyone knows it. Spencer, also very comparable and strategic. But for me, it was really wonderful to see Steven like so passionate and emotional about this game, mm-hmm. whereas it kind of contrasts with Spencer, who seems very robotic and like he's forcing himself to like make these very shallow connections specifically because exactly. it will help his game. And so for me, it kind of made Spencer seem a little bit more unsettling and really helped me appreciate <laughs> Steven even more than I already do because I'm already such a fan of his. So... And that's fair, because, I mean, Spencer's big thing was revealing that he liked his girlfriend a little bit. So, I mean, 
compared that to Steven, <laughs> it it's just, you know, a giant mess. <laughs> okay, now, Matt, I want to ask you something, and I want you to be real with me, okay? Could you mm-hmm. eat all that gross food that was in the gross food challenge? Would you have a problem with that? Uh, I would have a big problem. Um, I participated in Bob Crowley's uh, survival, Durham Warrior Survival Challenge two years ago. And um, I, I, it was super fun. Kobe Archer and myself and uh, Kathy from the first, you know, we, we were all the, the former survivors. And I tell you what, I had to do a gross food eating challenge one morning. And um, I had to eat these, uh, they were fish eyeballs. And they were about as big as mm. human eyeballs. And they were they were like staring Ew. at me on this plate. Ah. And they, it smelled so horrible. And my wife, like the cool thing about that, that charity event that Bob Crowley does is there's a live group of people like watching you play this game. So my mm. wife and all these people are watching and I'm trying to eat these freaking fish eyeballs. I'm just puking <laughs> everywhere. And then I tried to eat, um, it was like cow tongue or something. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I was trying to, cause I, I was trying to, you know, get into it and be like, okay, you gotta just put this in your mouth and swallow it. But my gag reflexes are just too bad, dude. I just, you know, there's, I don't think there's any way that I would have, uh, done well in a challenge like that. I would have been so like, you would have been you like- saw Cass and Sierra. Yeah. I'd just mm-hmm. be puking it up. You know, I can't help it. I mean, but I don't want to tell anyone that. that in case I, ever- <laughs> I never want to eat ever swap. again after watching. That. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, pe- yeah. Um, so Matt, so are you saying there's a tiny, tiny, like sliver, a small silver lining to you being booted early because you didn't have to participate in the gross food challenge in your season? Like a very minute, small silver line? No. I mean, like, <laughs> I, 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 would have, I would have done my best. I don't think anyone could have beat Cochran. That food eating challenge, he looked like he was eating like, you know, luxurious steak dinners. He ate that stuff like no other. Some people could just, you know put it down like they're drinking a, a, a shot of alcohol or something, you know what I mean? But other people just, you know, it's just disgusting. The smell mm-hmm. and the sounds and the, uh, I don't know, juices flying in your mouth. It's, oh, it's gross. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what about that first challenge we saw, the one where you oil, oil yourself up? Would you want to participate in that one? Oh, yeah. Ch- challenges are super cool. And that's one of the things, I mean, when I got voted out, I was so bummed as a fan because I wanted to be able to go and I had so much more game left in me um, in, in, in the terms of challenges and just the strategic gameplay. So, yeah, I would, all those challenges I would, I would love to do. It looked fun. And, um, and it was pretty fun. Uh, you know, go ahead. Oh, go, go right ahead. No, I'm just going to say tonight, sometimes it's funny watching people's tactics on that oily challenge, watching Fishback <laughs> and, you know, some of the girls trying to, like, ice skate across. It's pretty funny. Mm-hmm. I would have, like, penguin waddled. Um, something I've always wanted to actually ask a Survivor contestant, and even though I, th- I think you're probably, like, the 30th one I've ever talked to, would you say it's better to be kind of, like, blindsided in the heat of the game and playing your hardest, or to be kind of just what happened to you, which is just being picked off? Like, to me... Wouldn't it feel better to be blindsided, or what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I guess being blindsided, it's like, hey, you know, I didn't see it coming. I mean, in 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 my situation, in my season, you know, when, when we did the tribe swap, we got over to their beach, and we knew that the four favorites were going to stay together, and it was going to be mm-hmm. either Michael, Julia, or myself. They basically straight up said it like, hey, welcome to our camp. But just so you guys know, if we lose a challenge, it's one of you guys, no matter what. Mm-hmm. We're sticking together till the merge. So you're like, well, OK, so I tried my best and did every tactic that I could to try to get in with Don and Cochran and all them. And in the end, I got voted out and it's like no hard feelings. It was it's mm-hmm. a game. And uh, I tell you what, though, when, when I first the when I saw my name pop up on my season, I, I knew that it was going to be me. Mm-hmm. And it's like the most terrible, it was the most terrible feeling ever because there were other people that were on my original go to tribe that were not even survivor fans that made mm-hmm. it deep into this game. And so to me, it didn't mean as much to them as it would have for a, a true fan of the game, you know? 
And this is that's and nothing think, against anyone from my tribe, but it's you know, it's real special. I to think me, that know? could almost be comparable to someone like let's say Vetus being voted out over someone like Abby, because we all know Abby's not going to win, and yet you know Abby's just kind of out there playing chaotically. So maybe I could understand, or even someone like Varner really being really upset that Abby's still in. But I just want to point out, Alicia did say that when I asked you that question, there was actually a third better option, which is not being voted out at all. I think you probably would have preferred that <laughs> yeah. route. Yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, yes. Uh, just give it a yeah. Choice. That's what I would, yeah. Being voted out sucks. <laughs> okay, so Jack, what do you make of Kimmy? flat out giving up during the gross food challenge because i kind of freaked out a little bit i'm like oh my god here you are your second chance and you still won't eat the brains like what did you think of that yeah i was pretty shocked to be honest i don't know if it was before that or after the food eating challenge but i think it might have been joe who suggested kimmy like oh she's not going to be good in challenges and then all of a sudden she shows up at the food eating challenge and won't eat this pig brain when it could give her tribe like a huge moral support having a ton of food and getting to celebrate so I think in those situations, at least try, like make it seem like you were trying and give some sort of an effort, but just flat out just like saying, we'll go right ahead and eat this. You deserve this. Like you get this point. It's mm -hmm. pretty disheartening imagining watching your food just like slipping away because one person won't even attempt to eat this. Exactly. And like, I think Matt, you even said that. Is she vegan? Is she like religious? Won't eat pork? Or what was her? She is She's a been, vegetarian. Kimmy was vegetarian. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, though, my wife's been a vegetarian since she was like 12 years old. And if my wife was to play Survivor, I damn well know she would have tried to eat the food. Because to me, <laughs> it, 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 it's a different story. Eating a pig brain is different than like eating like uh, a grilled chicken. You know, if she's vegetarian. I get it. She won't eat. She won't eat like, let's say, a grilled chicken sandwich or and same with my wife. But in the game of Survivor, eating a pig brain is so so abnormal off the charts <laughs> that it shouldn't even be a category of your, you know, your everyday kind of whatever, exactly. you know? Yeah. And my big argument would be that the pig's already dead, so... <laughs> eh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I no, mean, I guess the pig brain is just getting thrown away. If it was exactly. Too. Well, the pig brain's going to be service again tonight, but that's towards the end. Elise, me and you haven't talked too much tonight, but I do want to talk about kind of uh, Savage losing control, and do you think there was anything he could have done to actually have the vote be Spencer, or do you think that the moment he said Sierra's name, it was all over for him? Well, I think it was stupid of him to just put it all on Sierra in, in the first place, especially since Wu probably would have been like, oh yeah, that's cool, cool if you use my name or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think... He, there's stuff he could have got done. He could have gone to, instead of saying, hey, let's just all pretend to ignore Sierra to make this work, he should have, like, talked to her or talked more to Cass or just, just reform that bond with Abby. Uh, I think it makes it more obvious that it was Tasha who was really holding the glue holding together that alliance on Angkor, and without her being bringing Abby in, bringing Wu, Savage all together, it just kind of fell apart, and Savage just couldn't pick up the pieces there. That's actually a fantastic point, and I didn't make that connection until now. And if anything, I will say, I do think Tasha might try to latch on to Savage come merge, but maybe she'll be smart enough to, you know, cut his throat early on. Okay, so Alicia, do you think that the only reason Savage went home tonight is because Abby really didn't like... Or, I'm sorry, that Wu went home tonight is because Abby really didn't like him? Because to me, the obvious answer would be to vote out Savage, but, you know... Wu was the one that went home. How much do you think Abby's hatred for Wu played an effect to tonight's vote? Because we didn't get a confessional from her, really. Right. We, I'm sure. Even if she wasn't the driving force behind it, I'm sure she, as soon as she heard Wu's name, a little, a little lit up in her eye, and she was like, oh, <laughs> yes, let's do that. So, um, I mean, although I'm sitting back here thinking I'm back on all the episodes, has Abby voted with the same group of people more than like once at all? I don't believe she voted so. with Did she vote with Andrew and Tasha for PG and Varner? Uh Hold on, yeah. let me let me bring up the official shit. I believe she did. I just wondering, so. it's like constantly like making a buddy and then changing her mind and making like new shinier friends and then i just 
you know, for some says that she really is like wanting someone who will just like be there for her. Enough people are trying to be there for her that she's kind of just jumping from person to person. Exactly. And Matt, I guess what I want to ask you about, I wanted to ask you about Cass, but I'm going to also ask you about Abby. How would you play with these type of players that are completely unpredictable? Would you try to align with them? Would you try to get rid of them right away? What would you do? You know, that, that's hard. I mean, I know Abby on a personal level, um, you know, hung out with her and stuff. And Abby's super cool in, in real life in the game this time. It's, man, it's the same old um, crazy, you know, unpredictable Abby. I mean, she's a firecracker. That's just who Abby is. I enjoy mm-hmm. watching Abby because it's to me it's entertaining. And I like Abby, you know, um, Cass, I think we're going to start seeing more Chaos Cass as they show in the preview next time. I think Cass is very, very smart, and um, she could go deep into this game. It's going to be interesting to see the dynamic between Cass and Spencer moving forward. Mm -hmm. Are they going to bond together and work together, or are they going to completely go separate ways? It's going to be interesting to see. But, um, you know, Cass, to me, is also a very entertaining um, mm. and, and good survivor player. I, I like watching her gameplay. So would you ally with her, though, if you're on the beach, you know, it's survivor, third chances, you're back because you just got second place because you were robbed in Survivor Seasons 35, Cass is back. <laughs> would you look at Cass and go, okay, I'm with you, or would you be like, nah, she's a wild card and we got to get rid of her right, right away? No, I, I don't. I don't foresee myself. I would. I would be pretty much probably trying to to get rid of Cass. I, I don't think I'd be aligning <laughs> you know, with Cass. I, 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 she, she's, it makes she's you feel better. That's how I too, feel. Too un, she's too. Un, yeah, she's too unpredictable. Now, Abby is kind of unpredictable, but I think that Abby, you know, has a, a heart in there to where she would probably be loyal. Like I think I could work with Abby. And, and but Cass, point, Abby get rid of her. Say, Abby did say on Twitter that the only reason she voted for Varner was because his foot was a lot more messed up than we were led to believe. Alicia, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I was just going to jump. I think it's kind of editing is developing the Spen story arc and the story. And I'm kind of wondering if one of them is going to end up redeeming themselves and the other is just not going to be they are. And that's going to make the difference mm-hmm. in where they end. Um, So I'm kind of interested in seeing actually fold completely okay your internet was breaking up a bit but you were basically saying that spencer and cash were both getting different redeeming story arcs and it's interesting to see if any of them fall back on their old habits yeah i think one of them might pull it off and then one of them won't see like the, mm. the huge difference in how are they made i think and that's true because the second chance theme seems to be running along, uh, you know, running this, running around kind of this whole season. It's the theme that carries everything together. And what's funny is, at least, and you can jump in on this if you like, is this whole idea of Spencer, if anything, was getting kind of like, oh, he's playing the same game as before, but now it's looking like he might change. And Cass was getting the edit like, oh, she's playing differently, but now it's like, oh, she might actually be the same. Uh, yeah, no, I think next episode is when we really we'll be able to see how this has played out we didn't because we just saw the vote Cass was on the fence or whatever and then now we'll get to see the reaction to that next episode I think it'll be something very interesting to watch out for and yeah I I don't know how it's going to go but I'm excited to find out because the Cass Spencer dynamic is so interesting and I think it's a blessing that they're now uh, on the same tribe and merging (laughs) the next episode together (laughs) And, and, I, and I guess, Jack, let's just take a moment to realize that. Is this who you actually thought would be around in this game at this point in time? I mean, Spencer's in, Cass in, Joe is still in. This is insane. Abby's still in. Yeah, there's a lot of people I saw pregame that I thought would just be too big of targets or too much of a wild card that people would be smart enough to just get rid of them. But a lot of these people, like you mentioned, that Jeremy, for example, that I think a lot of people thought that he might just be too much of a threat that he'd be taken out early. But he's sitting pretty right now, so the season has been very enjoyable, but not what I expected. Exactly. And, and Matt, what are your thoughts on this boot order? Because then I want to talk with you about editing a little bit. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would have suspected other people getting voted out. I mean, for, for example, I, if I were playing the game, I don't know if I would have wanted Wu out because Wu seems like someone that's really not that strategic. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's good in challenges, but I think he's a loyal person. I would have rather gone for um, a more strategic powerhouse. Like, hey, they, maybe they should have voted out Savage at that point in exactly. time. Exactly. Because Wu, you know, uh, Wu's going to get voted. I mean, yes, maybe he could win a bunch of immunity challenges. However, mm -hmm. in this season, you're going up against Jeremy and Joe and a lot of people that are badass physical players that it's going to be tougher for some of those guys to dominate every challenge. And... Um, so yeah, I would have probably went more toward getting a strategic player out and kept Wu around personally. And, and I agree with you because to me, it's like unless you're Abby Maria, you're probably gonna beat Wu in the finals. And then Alicia, <laughs> did you want to say something real quick? Oh, you're just touching her. Um, we have a lot of girls, and the girls like to constantly touch their hair, even though they both look good. I'm touching my um, ass. My contact is drying out. <laughs> yeah, contact's drying out. Um, and Matt, something else I want to talk to you about is we see players this season kind of like Kimmy and Sierra and Kelly Wigglesworth to an extent getting zero airtime. And as much as I hate to do this, at this point in the game, because we're almost at the merge, can we count them out? Can we, you know, if they're on your fantasy team, like how they're on my fantasy team, I mean, Keith is also, are they done? Is there any hope? No, I think there definitely is hope because, you know, obviously in the beginning, Jeff Barner got a ton of airtime and you would have thought, oh, maybe he's getting the, the, the Tony edit. Like when Tony won his season, you know, he dominated all the confessionals. I think that there's so many great characters and good players that now that it's merge time, even if you didn't see someone that had a lot of confessionals early on, that there may still be a chance for someone to go deep into the game. But, you, you know, you never know. Editing is tricky, you know, it's, and mm -hmm. it's like there could have been, you know, some of those other players that haven't got that much airtime could have been doing an amazing strategic game so far. Mm -hmm. But when you have the three different tribes and focusing on, you know, the losing tribe and leading up mm -hmm. the tribal council, then you got the two other tribes that aren't even getting any kind of airtime. So... It's tough. I, th I think it's going to be interesting come the merge to see okay. kind of who shines through, you know? So the fact that I have Kelly Wigglesworth and Keith, and that's all I have left on my fantasy team, I shouldn't worry is what you're saying. I'm probably going to win it all. No, I don't think Kelly... I don't think Kelly Wigglesworth, you know, she's getting... Which is odd. I mean, she's gotten zero, you know, airtime at all as far as confessionals go. Keith, I, you know, Keith is one of those guys where he wasn't really a fan on, on his first season, like a real true Survivor fan, and really didn't know what he was doing. But I think Keith was like someone enjoyable to watch. And I'm actually, uh, you know, he did great challenges in his first season, as we know. And uh, it's going to be interesting. But, you know, your fantasy league is probably, you know, done for. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Oh, well. I want to let you know, Matt, that I typically always get the winner picks very close to being correct, so I'll take the loss this season. All right, guys. Yeah. We've covered just about everything. You know, Cash is going evil again, So, but here's what we're going to do for this next part, for the last little segment. I'm going to, sit, I'm going to point to you, and then you're going to tell me who's being voted out next episode. Don't spend too much time on it, but I just want to hear the most wild, crazy guest ever. And Alicia, you had the best reaction to that, so you get to go first. Who's going home next episode and why? literally no idea i was actually trying to look at the showing them at merge and be like oh is anyone missing and then i was like wait that's not how that goes they merge <laughs> and then they do challenges so so you're trying to cheat good job yeah, <laughs> yeah. so who's going home just just throw a name out there yeah. no because he's such <laughs> a star like i don't know i I know it's hard, it's hard, but I love this. I love not having any idea what's going to happen. Okay, Jack, your turn. Unfortunately, since this person is on my fantasy team, but I feel like Andrew Savage might get the the merge yeah. boot. That would I feel like since very... he just he just had the, uh, he just got, not blindsided, but voted in the minority this, next, this mm -hmm. last episode, I feel like this would be, a, once again, like him getting voted out like close to merge. Oh, that'd be beautiful. Okay, Elise, and what do you think? Who's going home next? 
Uh, Alicia actually stole mine. I was going to say Joe, I think, because that has been kind of leading up to merge boot. Mm. So, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Now, Matt, do you have any idea? Do you have any any semblance on what's going to happen next? No, but I, I was going to go with Andrew Savage as well. Uh, based on the fact that he's playing really hard, and as you know what happened at Tribal Council, people kind of went against him. I think when he gets into the merge situation, people are going to kind of know how hard he's playing, and I mm-hmm. think he has a real good chance of getting voted out. Okay, I think it's going to be Cass. I think everyone's just going to be like, you know what? F this. She already went Chaos <laughs> Cast once and is not going to stand it. At least in my mind, that's what happened next. Now, Savage is going to be soon to follow, but in my mind, Cass is actually going to be next to so go. Colin. First jury member. So, Colin, yes. you didn't break our tie like you were supposed to do because you're the fifth person that was about to vote. And you really think they're going to devote all that time Cass in the promo for next episode and make it so obvious that it's Cass? Like, come on. Yes, I, I strongly believe that. I think Cass actually has a very high chance to go. And if I am right, every one of you besides Matt owes me $2. Oh, so, I never, I never agreed to this bet. That's the way this one works. I'm the host. Okay. So, before we wrap things up, does anyone have any soapbox? Does anyone have any final thoughts? Any, you know, anything they want to say before we close uh, out for the evening? I guess I wanted to ask you, Matt, really quick. We saw Jeremy at the very end grab a little bite of that gross egg. Um, when you're out there, obviously you're so hungry. Um, is that something that you would even consider doing or would you just, (laughs) not not at all. And and let me just tell you in my season, I did not win a single reward challenge. So all we had was we ate like a little seashell full of rice once a day. And, but to me being thirsty was way worse than the hunger. And like, so I would cut open coconuts and drink the coconut water all day long. They would call me Coconut Dundee because I was always <laughs> doing it. I climbed coconut tree. You know, that's one thing that sucked. Talking about editing, it was raining out, and Michael and I were hiking down this trail, and we were kind of, uh, you know, wanting some coconuts, and there was no more around. And Michael's like, Matt, there's coconuts up that tree. And I was like, well, I never climbed a coconut tree. So I, I started climbing it. And I got about I got about halfway up, and they they ended up like filming this awesome thing. I climbed this coconut tree like Ozzy, got all these coconuts down, and I was all excited that that was going to be on the episode. And they never even aired it. But my, <laughs> but my, so my point being is, uh, I I don't like coconut, so I would drink the coconut water, but I would barely eat the coconut you know meat or whatever they call it. Like, the coconut itself, even though I was hungry, I wouldn't really eat that. So there's no way in hell I would eat remnants of that gross food eating challenge <laughs> at all. Well, I, and I can just picture you at home being like, all right, everybody, watch this, knowing that the episode where you climb the tree, come on, be like, hey, everyone, I'm so such a badass. And then they show Brandon crying for like 20 minutes. And yeah. you're just like, sweet, this is great. Well, <laughs> it, yeah, it was mind boggling. And it was really frustrating because knowing – how Michael and I were working together and how a lot of things were happening and Michael and I were just playing the game hard together. And they showed it a little bit, but not really. It's like someone else like Sherry who made it to the final three uh, would look like the strategic mastermind. And that's, that's the, that's the crazy part of editing because they're trying to tell a story of how these people got from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. And maybe since I didn't make it far, then I didn't get much airtime, but, um, it's uh, it's tough going into the game. You got to know that mm-hmm. you don't know what's going to get aired. And you you know when when I was out there playing, had I known that Shamar was going to get the airtime that he did, I would have freaking wanted to just let's just vote him out. Like he he dominated a lot of the airtime. So and America really would have thanked you. Very, you would have done that. Yeah, yeah was, I hear you. But uh, overall, like I said, I'm. Yeah, it was frustrating, but you know, I don't want to. I don't want to sound like a complainer because I'm very, very fortunate. Out of all the people in the world that want to play Survivor, I got to do it, and I got to still. I, I still do charity events. I get to talk to you know you guys on your podcast, and it's just amazing to be a part of this big, cool Survivor family with the fans, and with you know, cast members of the show. And I guess that is the silver lining to it. I just want to say though. 
as a Survivor super fan, I completely, completely understand though you getting your one shot and playing Survivor, the greatest game ever. And I mean, if you played and they said, hey, going into it, we're not going to show a single one of your confessionals, you would still do it. But it's still a little, I can understand oh, yeah. why it would be a little disheartening. I think it would be a bummer. Yes. You don't sound like you're complaining, yeah. but obviously, like, it's a bummer. Like, yeah. there's no... And we all agree that the it editing is... on your season was complete horseshit, if I'm being frank. <laughs> oh, it, it, was, it was, yeah, it completely, it sucked. Like, mm. out of all, here's the deal, out of all the seasons, I've only applied twice for Survivor. I applied in, like, 2003. Mm. I made a mm. video. No one ever called me. And I didn't apply again until the season that I got on. And uh, I told my wife, I said, I'm going downstairs, I'm making a video, and I'm getting on Survivor this time. And I did it. And it's just crazy, though, that out of all the damn seasons of Survivor, I ended mm -hmm. up on a season like I did, Fans versus Favorites, where the fans got screwed on any kind of airtime. And then I wasn't even on stage at my freaking finale, which was yeah. the biggest bunch of bullshit I've ever seen in my life. It and sucked. We all agree. Because I want to listen to the choir. Yeah. Yeah. I think Probes even. Did Probes actually apologize for it or did he just acknowledge that it was a mistake? I don't remember. I don't think either. I mean, the reality of it is, is, you know, I, the reason that I was mad is because I didn't think that I was going to get. Uh, you know, Jeff talking to me on stage at the finale, okay? Mm -hmm. But I I feel that it was going to be the closure that I needed for my Survivor experience. Mm -hmm. the, the finale, your family and friends are, are there, and you just want to be a part of this game that you played, mm -hmm. and it was just a complete disrespect to the people, you know, me and everyone else that didn't get to be on the stage was complete and utter just a crock of shit man and i agree with you and that's why you have the podcast endorsement for second chances part two i <laughs> hope beyond hope you're on that ballot and we will all vote for you constantly in a perfect world we'll never phrase that in a semi-perfect world i'm going to be on that ballot also because i'm going to get robbed at the final five but that that's that's neither here or there um but right i guess on, uh, a take a takeaway would be that fans versus favorite seasons especially what happened with you guys I'm not the only Survivor Superman that feels this way, but I actually limit when I apply for the show because of the fear that I have of getting on a fans versus favorite season. And I think it's kind of sad that, you know, because of what happened during your season, a lot of people feel like I do, where we're like, we don't even want to, we'll play whenever, but we don't want to be dealt the same kind of crappy hand you were dealt. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's a sucky feeling, I can tell you that. You know what I mean? But like I said, um, you know, my overall my experience was good, but I I would love to just be back again sometime. I would love to play with my wife, and uh, you know, if they ever do another Blood versus Water, and um, or I'd love to see my wife play because um, she's a lot different. I, I'm I'm more Mr. Nice Guy. She's more cutthroat, I think, than I am. But you never know. You never know. So Maybe you'll see watch. us on Blood versus Water. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully you'll It'll be on Blood versus Water, and I'll be there. With like my mom or something or my brother, who knows? Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> Anyways, I want to thank Jack. I want to thank Elise. I want to thank my wonderful co-host Alicia, and I want to thank you, Matt, for coming on tonight and discussing this fantastic episode of Survivor Cambodia. This season seems to be only getting better. Um, I'm done crying over Jeff Varner, but I think pretty soon I'm gonna be crying over the fact that this season's almost over. So I do want to thank all your listeners out there, and once again, I want to thank all the panelists and our special guests tonight for joining us. It's always a pleasure, and have a wonderful evening. Bye. See ya. Bye. Bye.